trying to record this. I'm wearing a hat, as you can see. And I'm not a big drinker, which is why after half a glass of wine, I'm pretty much incoherent. Um, let me just make sure I'm, I'm streaming. It's always, it's always an adventure. Every time I'm like surprised that it's working. Uh, is it working? Who knows? And maybe no one's tuning in yet because the show's supposed to start at 7.30. But like I said, I'm just scrolling down as we speak. Um, I'm just going to assume we're going live. Fuck it. Uh, Iris Bar here, wearing a hat that I found in storage. Um, still in New York, still in my friend's amazing loft. And I went to this spot down the street um, where my friend Dan is an amazing drummer. Dan, I don't know how he pronounces it in English. Dan Aran, Dan Aran. Um, new friend, I call him friend. I met him for the first time today, but that's the kind of person I am. I'm the kind of person that calls people friends that I've never even met. Is that LA? I don't know if it's LA. I don't know what that is. Um, I'm not a fake person. I don't, uh, I'm not a name, well, I'm a name, no, I'm not a name dropper. I usually, I value friendship, but now I feel like he's a friend, okay? Because I went and supported his music. He's an amazing drummer. He was playing with this collective um, at this place called 1803, and they were amazing. Horn player, he's a flautist. Where did that come from? Where did flautist, not flutist? Is flutist a vulgar word, and then they opted to go with flautist? Who knows? I'm gonna check again on the Facebook page because again, I don't trust technology. I definitely don't trust Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not seeing it live. Maybe I'm not live, maybe I am. Do I go to the videos? Does anyone care? Um, should I be talking about this as I'm doing a live stream? I am live. Okay, there's one person. I wonder who that one person is. I can you tell that I've had a little wine? This is insane. How does someone get drunk from one not even a full glass of wine. How does that happen? Can you tell that I'm talking in a higher, in a higher cadence, an octave, and I'm, I'm doing the up speak? Is that the wine? <clears throat> I sound like Trump at his latest rally. I'm not sick, I'm not contagious. I'm gonna kiss all the beautiful women. Oh. Someone said something interesting to me. Cause I kept going, Trump's a liar. He goes, no, he's not. I go, yes he is. He goes, no, he's not. He's incapable of lying. He has no filter. I don't know if that's true. That's an interesting statement. I tried to think about it. I'm like, he says shit. He doesn't filter. So he constantly displays the insanity, right? He has no capability of, of no impulse control. And that's the, the narcissism. But is he a liar? I'm like, well, yeah, he's lied about a lot of stuff. And he's like, like what? And I'm like, I don't know. He's, he's lied. I think he's lied, right? I mean, my God, that seems like a given. I feel like I shouldn't be making any political statements right now. Uh, because I am slightly incoherent. I consider myself an intelligent human being and I feel like I could be smarter and I wanna say smart things. I like to say smart things. Um, I've been watching the, the confirmation hearings all the time. And everyone's like, why? It's a charade. Do you say charade or charade? I say charade, but in this case, I'm gonna say charade. Um, I find it fascinating. I find the legalese, fa I'm learning new things. <clears throat> I can see past the political bullshit, but is it weird that I actually believe she has integrity? Is that weird? Because I'm, does that make me a weird person? Don't I believe her where she's not gonna be a pawn and she's not gonna make judgments? Am I delusional? Maybe I am. So calm and collected, this woman, and you can't help and admire her, her academic record, regardless of her crazy ass views. I'm not, please. Don't think I'm condoning any of her personal views. Please don't think that. Um, but I found, I'm like, no, maybe she, you know, I'll take her at her word. Maybe she won't. She's just gonna look at the text. I'm trying to wrap my head around the constitution. Again, maybe I shouldn't be talking about um, these topics right now when I'm not in my usual brilliant state of mind. Let me call myself brilliant because that's also the wine talking. I think I have a, a sharp analytical mind. I think I do. I think I'm ignorant about a lot of stuff. That's the weird dichotomy with me. Um, sometimes I feel like, ah, you think I know stuff. I don't. Um, but where was I going with this? This is the problem. This is why people shouldn't drink literally three sips of red wine. I had to order because I was trying to shoot video of, of, of my friends, my jazz collective. Can I call it a band? A band says, I'm like, yeah. But I was trying to shoot that and I felt weird shooting and standing there without um, ordering anything. So I ordered a glass of wine and it's New York. 
and it was twenty dollars for mediocre wine. I don't think that would happen in Italy or France. I feel like in Italy or France, not Germany, because I don't know if the Germans know red wine. Um, I feel like they have a cheap table wine, even Portugal. Let's include Portugal in this festivity. You could order a cheap wine and not be embarrassed, and it's good for the meal. But God forbid in New York, you order a cheap wine, especially if I'm not eating. I ordered a $20 glass of wine, and I only had time to drink three sips because I had to come back here and slur in front of you guys and rant about Amy Coney Barrett. Um, six kids, dude. Six kids. Kid with special needs. You got you to gotta admire it. The woman. I'm sorry. Again, it's. I feel. I feel like in this current culture, I'm like afraid to say that I admire this woman who I may completely disagree with on all her personal views. God help me. But can we still admire? Admire it. Can we? Yes, we can. Is it still terrifying that Roe v. Wade and and affordable health care is in question? Yes, it is terrifying. Um. I'm trying in today's climate, and again, fight as far as you want. It is a charade. There's going to be confirmation, but still, uh, due process is interesting, even if it is a charade, right? I'm wearing socks right now in the house. I'm going to show you my sock. I'm wearing a sock, okay? I don't know if I should be wearing, I'm going to take the socks off now, okay? I'm going to do that. They're ankle socks, which are annoying because I'm not sporty, and I don't need the ankle socks to go on a run. I like knee-high socks like an old lady. I'm, I'm one step away from buying compression socks. My dad wearing compression socks. Does anyone have any questions in the meantime, now that I'm talking to my four beloved listeners? Um, this would be considered an official rant. Six people, I love it. I hope you like my hat. There are comments already. Let me read the comments. Um, disgusting beliefs. Yes, Chris, you're right. She, was, she has seven kids? Have I eaten today? <laughs> Thank you, Christine. First of all, I love that you're here. And thank you, Chris Patrick. You're right. It's so odd. You know what I'm learning? And maybe this is late in the game. The complexity of humanity, where you're disgusted by someone's beliefs, but you can admire a certain aspect of them, right? I mean, we're not robots. Wasn't that the theme of of Hannah Gadsby's Nanette? Isn't that the theme and the problematic nature of cancel culture? Where it really becomes a dichot- it becomes a black and white and a dichotomy. Picasso, brill- I don't think he's a brilliant artist. I'm not saying he's mediocre. I'm just saying sometimes I feel like maybe a little overrated with the blue period or some of the cubism. Um, I can admire his importance in the, the, the artistic canon. Um, but obviously a horrible misogynist. Can we admire? Can we still like an old Woody Allen movie? These are not questions that I'm the first one posing, but I do feel like should I be looking into camera to be more, you know, there we go. God, I love this hat. I feel, I feel artsier in this hat. What are you going to do? I'm going to take the hat off. Look, just an average mom in a mom bod who had a little too much to drink because she's, she's lonely and depressed. That's not me today. Maybe yesterday. Yesterday I was lonely and depressed. Today I'm not lonely and depressed. But you put the hat on and look, there's a whole world of knowledge and artistic prowess in this human. And here, maybe I can talk about kids napping schedule with any interest, and maybe not. It's a toss up. With the hat, no one's gonna talk to me about napping. No one would dare, no one would dare talk to me about parenting in this hat, okay? Which is what I like. When I was a, um, I'm gonna refresh the page. (laughs) When I was a young, young parent, that's a oxymoron. We lost one, we're now at five. I don't know what that means. Who did we lose in the interim? We have six comments now. Who did we lose? Thank you, you're adorable. Is it six or seven children? What is going on? Now there's an argument about how many children she has. Can I just say one thing about adoption? I don't think people adopt enough. Um, I believe, and this is not me, I think it's harder for a single mom to adopt, which I think is fucked up because I'm a kick-ass parent. And after the quarantine, I see a lot of dysfunctional family units. So I feel like single people. Also, I think I just heard that you can't adopt after the age of 50 or something like that. I just heard that from someone, which I also think is ludicrous. Some rules make no sense. I mean, some rules, there's an inherent judgment in them that pisses me the fuck off. But adoption entails 
and again, this is a whole ethics philosophy. Is there such a thing as altruism? Is an act less noble if it makes you feel good? We can go into that another day. But in every, uh, you know, people that are posting pictures of their biological kids, there is a level of narcissism in there, especially if, oh, they look like you, even on a subconscious level and even on an evolutionary level, like you're protecting, you, you're proud of your kid because he came from you. But there is this narcissistic quality to it. And there's something so beautiful and I think pure about adoption where, and again, I don't care if it makes you feel like a savior, whatever it is, you're still adopting and you're still taking on a kid that you didn't pr physically produce that looks nothing like you, or maybe you're adopting kid doesn't, whatever. Um, and you're taking that on and you're loving this kid. And I think that there's something really beautiful and, and powerful about that. I remember I, um, I met a, uh, a makeup artist who adopted, I think, several kids from India that had special needs. Now, as someone who lost a brother to special needs, uh, not too special, but he had special needs, he was severely mentally handicapped and passed away. I am so appreciative um, of people that adopt with special needs. I really am. And I think it's a rare occurrence and people that do that and have the means to do it are amazing humans. I'm just gonna say it. Um, so, if you can't adopt, adopt. If you can foster a child for a while or forever, foster. That's all I'm gonna say. I don't mean to be preachy, but I don't think people appreciate, and I'm, I'm, I'm not especially, I think everybody that adopts is amazing, but people that already have biological kids that are adopting. Obviously, I, 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 I admire and the people that adopt, if they can't have kids, it's all beautiful, but people that cannot have, or that have kids, in a full family that adopt, I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing. So I'm just gonna say that. So maybe that was my um, initial admiration for the woman with the clan. Uh, and I mean clan in a good way, I don't mean to, okay. But again, I'm not, this is separate, separate and distinct from her uh, beliefs on uh, a woman's right to choose, on healthcare, on a slew of things, on immigration, whole other ball of wax. People are confusing sometimes. People do good shit and then do really evil shit. So what do you do? Does evil outweigh? Usually it does, because you're like, okay, you know, this is, this is connected to another thing. And uh, <laughs> I can tell that I'm just ranting on. People that call someone nice, even though they're only nice to people they like. I don't call that person nice. I know a few people that can be assholes and, and just bitches to, 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 and I use men and women when I say bitch. I hate when men only use bitch for women. Um, Assholes and dicks to people, but once you get to know them or if they warm up, they're nice to you. That's not a nice person. That's an asshole. You kind of judge people by their asshole behavior, not by their nice behavior, because once they know what you've accomplished or once they've accepted you, they're nice. That's not nice. That's agenda driven. I don't like it. I'm a nice person. I'm a fucking nice person. Okay. Do I have my moments? No, I don't. I actually don't have my moments. Well, maybe I had to have some moments. Is this a wine burp? There it was. It was there and it came and it went. Um, I haven't had a lot to eat. This is my, my friend who I'm staying with right now, who's not here, doesn't have any heat or gas functioning. So I can't cook anything. And I'm tired of spending $26 on a Shake Shack burger. Is Shake Shack overrated? Is this another discussion? I'm gonna say something right now that might be controversial. in and out overrated. in and out is overrated. I'm sorry, I know people sometimes complain about the fries, but I think beyond the fries, they're overrated. And I do think it's all about the bun and the, the stuff you put on the bun. The meat, am I, am I alienating my vegans? I went out with a militant vegan a month ago. The cliche about vegans is true. And I get why people are vegan. I think I've talked about this before. But there is some sort of impulse control that a vegan cannot control talking about veganism. I mean, they can't, they can't help it. A vegan cannot sit at a table with someone and not talk about, are you vegan? Are you, are you a meat eater? I can accept meat eaters. No, you can't. Why would you date a meat eater? I feel like this with people that are sober. And again, I, I know a lot of people in the program. And I feel like if, and I'm not talking about the people that have been sober 20 years and have no problem, but I do feel like it's something so central in your life. Why would you put yourself in a position to be with people that don't share that value system. Why would you want to be with me? I like a good steak. Do I agree that, you know, cow slaughter is terrible and the methane and, and yeah, I agree with that. 
but once in a while I eat a, I eat a steak. I'm not a like, eh, you know, I'm not a gun toting hunter. Seems to have worked with, for Joe Rogan though. He's got what, 20 million gazillion followers and he, he talks about his hunting and, and posts pictures of ribs. I don't know. Um, do vegans listen to Joe Rogan? Do vegans say I enjoy Joe Rogan's uh, uh, content? Um, you know, I don't know. I, do they? I don't know. Uh, maybe they do. He's got enough. I mean, can, can it all of his uh, followers be meat eaters? Or are some vegans secretly enjoying Joe Rogan? I don't know. Um, I feel strongly about a lot of stuff, but I don't know. I don't know. I mean, again, this is where the incoherence comes into play. Um, I can't date a vegan unless they're a really mellow vegan, which I have not met yet. I did go on a date recently with someone who is a Freemason. I didn't know they were still active. In Los Feliz, I used to drive by a temple that said Freemason Temple. That really harkens to another era, doesn't it? Is it a men's club and they just smoke cigars or do they deal with, with sorcery? This guy mentioned sorcery on the date. I don't know in what context it was, but he suddenly said the words black magic, and sorcery in a sentence relating to something modern day. So I don't know. Um, I do find it, you know, I keep thinking when I think like Freemasons, I think of, of uh, Eyes Wide Shut, even though Eyes Wide Shut had nothing to do with Freemasons. There is something sexy about secret society, cults, symbols, but is there a place for them in, in today's society? I don't know, I've been watching The Vow um, I don't know if you've been watching The Vow on HBO. I'm obsessed with cults. Can I just say something about cults? And I will, because I still have some time before my first guest, Fred Melamed, shows up. Brilliant actor. I love Fred so much. Um, I did research on cults in my own spare time. There was a study, and I don't want to alienate my Scientology viewers. I don't know any Scientologists right now. I did meet years ago a nice Jewish boy who said to me, he, he asked me out, we got on the phone and he said, I work at the Museum of Psychiatry, which is a known Scientology establishment. When you drive down Hollywood Boulevard, Museum of Psychiatry, Psychiatry Kills. That was the thing, but that's a whole other story. The minute he said that, I go, good luck. Again, like vegans and like sober, date another Scientologist. Why, unless you wanna recruit me, which with this hat, you can tell I will not be recruited, okay? This screams no cult. Um, you need to date another Scientologist. I mean, this is such a central part of your life. It's like an Orthodox Jew hanging out with Baha'i. I mean, you know I, mean? I don't know why I chose Baha'i. I still feel like Baha'i kind of accept everything. So I feel like a Baha'i would date an Orthodox Jew. Maybe an Orthodox Jew wouldn't date a Baha'i. You want to keep it in the, in the thing, in the family. Or not in the family, literally, because that would not bode well for us. Um, where was I going? I was talking about, oh, the cult. So there was a study. that, And again, there's all these, and I don't use cult in a broad term, not just Scientology. There's other self-help groups that indoctrinate and also use terms. Hi, Fred. Fred's on already. I'm going to hide Fred for a minute and then I'll bring him on. There are um, organizations and, that use terminology in a new way to create a secret language that makes you feel in on, on not on the joke, but in on, you know what I mean? It's like, ooh, I'm, I'm accessing knowledge I would not otherwise be able to access. Uh, like the forum. Now, again, I have a lot of friends that did the forum, EST, or used to be EST. It changed their life. I have other friends that got sucked in and are playing, paying thousands of dollars for workshops. They use the word racket in a new way. I'm not going to go down that road because we want to start the show. At some point, we want to start the show. This has been the longest rant ever, and I do credit uh, the very full-bodied red wine. I'm not a, um, I like my wine dry, and I like it full-bodied. I don't like uh, my men dry and full-bodied. Maybe I do. You know what? Now that I think of it, maybe I like my men dry and full-bodied. That's not how I sell myself, even though I've become full-bodied. I gained, I gained more than 15 pounds, I think, during quarantine. This has stayed remarkably slender. So this is good for Zoom, even though this little double, see this? A little bit has happened. A little bit. But with duct tape, anything can be fixed. See that? Anything can be fixed. Bottom portion, a little pear-shaped. I like pears. I'm a fan of the fruit. Um, so I'm not worried about it too much. Uh, my dates may be. I'm getting emails. I should quit my email program. It's always annoying when you're Zooming with someone, you hear bing, bong, ching. I'm going to quit that. I quit that. Okay. Any, I'm going to refresh the page. I'm going to bring Fred on. My first guest, Fred, 
and I hope I'm, I, I'm going to say Melamed, but you may correct me and say Melamed, as the Israelis do, Fred Melamed, or maybe be Fred Melamed. Um, Fred, can you join us? Join? Yay! Hi, Fred. Hi, Iris. How are you? I'm good. It, can I, how do I pronounce it? It's Melamed. It is Melamed. It is okay. Melamed. I mean, properly, it's Melamed, as you said. Yes. Although some Sephardics, like my family, <laughs> said they had, they said kind of Melamed. I'm going to say Melamed, but you make. Yeah. So you are. What is your ethnic background, Fred? Um, do I look Jewish? Yes, but you could also say to me that you you have Finnish blood, and I would believe it. You know what I mean? I feel like you could also be like a Viking, and I'd be like, yeah, I get it. The long lineage of Vikings. So. Um, well, uh, my, I was adopted, so that's a somewhat, somewhat ah. a complicated question. But from a physiological point of view, my father was a Sephardic uh, Jew uh, born in England. Uh, he was a psychoanalyst, and when uh, he was a young lad, um, fairly young lad, uh, the Blitz went on, and he lived in Kent, but the Blitz was happening, so he was sent to live with his grandmother in South Africa. So he spent his teenage years in South Africa, and then when he was about 17, he and his mother and father all moved to New York. Oh, wow, okay. So he, he was a Sephardic Jew. My biological mother is a Hungarian Gentile. It's mm. odd, since, since when you look at me, you know, I'm like under the <laughs> Jew dictionary picture is my picture, but my, I'm actually uh, technically, by uh, the old standards of how people are judged to be Jewish, not Jewish. And I was never bar mitzvah or any of that stuff. Oh, wow. Okay. So, but so, mother's side, not Jewish, according to the rabbis, but genetically, there's Jew in you. There on is my Jew father's you. side. There's Jew in you. And were you raised by Jews? Uh, my, my adoptive parents were both Jewish, although uh, they were not observant and found the whole thing kind of, they were showbiz lefties. Oh. And they found the whole uh, idea of religion, particularly the religion from which they sprouted, um, kind of amusing. And laughable. Can they I be remember, defined as communists? Uh, back in the day, yes. Okay. Back in the back in the back in the late thirties, yeah. My <laughs> parents were my parents were older. Um, my my father was born in nineteen fourteen. My mother was born in nineteen twenty two. Amazing. So they were old enough to have really lived through the depression. So that you know, and have see come home from school and see their belongings out on the street <laughs> after oh, wow. out of their apartments so they they ha having had that in their in their um seminal experiences uh, they grew up sympathetic to the to the idea that um uh the working man uh, has to be helped was and, this in new york was this in la obviously they said there were so people in new york okay yeah. well and, like lower east side situation or what uh no uh this my father grew up uh, in the Bronx, and my mother grew up in Brooklyn. Okay. Oh my God, I love that. Did you hear me rant and rave about people that adopt? Were you there I, for that I, portion? I, I, no, I only heard the, you talking a little bit about having put on a few LBs in quarantine. <laughs> I missed the, uh, the, the adoption part. I was just but, saying, and I won't, I won't repeat all of it because I was ranting for quite. I've had half a glass. I'm not a big drinker. I had half a glass of wine, and I feel like I'm just, you know, high as a kite. Um, I was just saying that I've been watching the confirmation hearings, and as much as I disagree with. Um, with, uh, sorry, I'm trying to, um, as much as I disagree with, with the woman's views of Amy Coney Barrett, I, I, I admire people that adopt. And I think that there's something so beautiful about raising an adopted child without that narcissistic evolutionary, this person came from me, looks like me factor. There's a, well, a giving. I agree with you, although right. I, I, oh, I agree with you and I admire people who adopt children, particularly children that are different than they are. However, yes. yes. Um, I would say from my own personal experience that the adoption process is not devoid of narcissism for certain people. No, you're probably, no, I was saying that too. Like people are like the savior, the savior syndrome and all that. But at the end of the day, once you adopt, you're still, you're taking this child on for the rest of their life. So I feel like even if initially you think like a savior, once you're doing the work, you know yeah. what I mean? It's still a, a I don't know what, if you're comfortable talking about the circumstances of your adoption. Oh, or I'm happy to talk about it. I'm happy to okay. talk about it. So what were, what were the, uh, how did that come about? Well, <laughs> okay. So I always knew that I was adopted. I was told that I was adopted uh, as soon as I could talk, which was what, 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 how pa parents were counseled to do it in those days. 
But I didn't really understand uh, the specifics of it. I was told that I was, I was chosen from a room full of babies. My parents said that they went into a room full of babies and I was smiling and they liked me and they chose me. Um, I was curious and asked my parents questions about the, my origins when I was young. But as I grew older, um, I didn't have, as some people do, any kind of burning uh, compulsion to find out, you know, find my birth parents or find out what their real story was. I, I accepted what my parents said and I, you know, that was kind of all there was to it. And I didn't really worry about much. And then one day when I was 27 years old, which is now 28 years ago, or something like that, <laughs> I, I came home for 38 years ago, I'm sick, I'm 64. So I came home, I came home today, uh, one day, not today, I came home one day, I'd been playing cards. This is why I lived in New York. And this is when the days when there were still answering machines. Okay. And there was an answer on my machine saying, my name is Nancy. Call me at such and such a number in California. And call me collect and you can call late. Collect. I remember calling collect. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, hmm, well, this is from California. Maybe it's about work. I was already an actor, you know, young actor. Okay. So I called her up. I said, hello. Uh, she said, is this Fred? I said, yes. She said, well, you don't know me. My name is Nancy. Uh, I, I know that you know that you're adopted. And I said, yes, I do. And she said, well, I'm your birth mother. I'm your biological mother. And my head sort of began to spin a little bit. And we talked for about two, two or three hours that night, all about the circumstances of my nativity, my birth, my adoption, everything and all that. I asked her who my father was. I asked her uh, all about what had led to the adoption, all that kind of stuff. And uh, when she found out, she was also an actress and director. And she was so, uh, when she found out that I was an actor and that I had been on Broadway and I went to Yale Drama School and da da da, she was like all excited about it. Uh, and it turned out that we had, our paths had crossed many times. I had been, when I first got out of school, I had gone to the Guthrie for a year, which is a, a theater out in uh, Minnesota, yeah. Minneapolis. And she had been there uh, some years before I was there. Um, and, you know, we knew a lot of the same people and it was all very, you know, oh, how surreal, amazing. And um, I had a kind of a contentious relationship with my own, with the mother that raised me, my, my um, adoptive mother, kind of difficult relationship. And I wasn't sure whether, an, and, and Nancy, my biological mother said to me, look, if you want to check and make sure that I'm telling you the truth about this, what you can do is you can go to the Hall of Records in the public library in New York and you have a birth certificate and if you're adopted you have two birth certificates you have your original birth certificate and then your adoptive birth certificate and they're not cross-referenced cross anywhere in other words you can't go in with one and find the other one. Oh, interesting because they want to prevent people from doing that right my adoption was a closed adoption as many of them are she said but if you check you'll see both birth certificates have the same number so wait, when so you said did adoption, was Nancy legally allowed to contact you? Or was that like part no. of the agreement that she was not allowed to do no, that? No, she was not. She was not. <laughs> here's like, what happened. <laughs> yeah. Here's what happened. Uh, my parents were married for 10 years, unable to have children, wanted to have children. And um, they had a friend who had adopted a child. And uh, <laughs> their friend did it through this woman uh, Fanny, I've forgotten her last name, who was, who would set up these private adoptions, who was an obstetrician slash abortionist in, in those days. And she lived in, she lived in Queens. Now, um, it turns out that Nancy, my biological mother's mother, had gone to performing arts high school in New York. And her best friend in perform performing arts was a woman called Crystal Field. Crystal Field is a well, was a well-known kind of person in the downtown theater scene in New York. She and her husband started a theater called Theater for the New City. Yeah, of course. I know Theater for the New City. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So her, she, she ran that theater, started it and ran it for many okay. years. So Crystal Field and Nancy were pals and Crystal Field's mother was this obstetrician slash abortionist okay. right, who set up these private adoptions. So my parents actually set up this adoption. Nancy became pregnant at the age of, I think she was 20, I don't remember exactly. I think she was 20, somewhere, 19, 20. And 
My parents paid for her to live for the latter six months of her pregnancy in Crystal Fields' house in Queens while I came to term. Oh and Nancy, Nancy told me that the only thing she did, for, all she did for those six months was eat chocolate and read Shakespeare. It kind of sums up the <laughs> rest of my life. Anyway, so, so Nancy said, we, we had all this stuff. I thought, okay, so I'm going to tell my parents, I should tell my parents about it. You know, I wasn't sure. And then my friend said, look, in matters of state, it's best to come clean. Okay. So I, I said, this woman called me. Her name, is, her name is Nancy Zala. She says she's my biological mother. Is this true? And my parents kind of looked at each other and they went, yes, it is true. <laughs> and what had happened was they had had a cousin who was, a, they tried to save a few shekels and they hired a cousin who was a lawyer who was used to doing like real estate, had no right. experience in adoptions, handle the adoption. <laughs> and he wasn't supposed to show the papers for each party to the opposite party with the names and addresses and phone numbers. But of course he did. Oh my God. This is, this is so he, he messed up. So they, they knew, they both knew each other's information. information. Right. right, right. So Nancy told me that she had uh, fantasized her whole life about, you know, like moving in next to me and watching me grow up. And I, it became clear to me in short order that I kind of represented every lost opportunity, every dream mm. deferred or lost in her life to her. Wait, so anyway, how old were you when she contacted you? Because you said 27. You're after 27. Yeah. And you were already a working actor. And she probably said, those are my genes, right? She took a little credit for that. She's like, you're an yeah. actor because of me. Okay, yeah. fair enough. So she said, listen, I live in California, uh, but I'm coming to New York soon. Uh, would you like to meet? So I said, well, yeah. So I remember very clearly walking into the bar uh, of the San Remo Hotel on 57th Street with a big box of pictures, photographs of, you know, my growing up, my mother and father, my sister, I have a sister who's their biological child. As often happens, six years later, they had a child of right. their own biologically. Right. You know, with Fire Island, growing up in Fire Island, me in school, you know, just pictures like that. Let me ask a quick, quick question though. You said you had a contentious relationship with your, um, your, the parent that raised you. Were you at this point like, not doing it out of spite, but how did she feel about it? And were you like, I'm going to meet my real mom? Was it that or was it? No. Was, okay. Okay. No, there was no, there was none of that in it at all for me. Okay. Except that I felt there was no bitterness in it, but I felt because of the way my mother was and the way that I responded. When I say my mother, I mean the mother that adopted me. Yeah. My mother was a person of volcanic emotions. Okay. And uh, a kind of very narcissistic worldview, meaning that it was very difficult to dis discriminate between what made her feel good and what was good for everybody else. Right. And you kind of had to either bend to her will or become subsumed by it. She was just such a huge force of nature and so powerful in her emotions. And at a very young age, an age before I was prepared to do this, I felt that in order to survive, I had to kind of extricate myself from her grasp and, and be separate when I was still, you know, an infant. Right, right, right. And uh, I think this left me, <laughs> I think this left me feeling um, uh, lonely uh, and uh, desiring somebody to have that level no, of- her will or become subsumed. Oh, I hear myself coming back. No, no, sorry, yeah. Anyway. Um, this left me sort of permanently lonely and, and feeling uh, like I'd like to be that close to somebody, but that it was implicitly dangerous. Anyway, so I was kind of looking for somebody and this was a kind of a tough period in my life when I was this age. Anyway, so there was no bitterness towards the mother that raised me, but I, I, I needed something. And I also f kind of felt that vibe from Nancy also, from my biological mother. So I remember going into this, this bar of this hotel where she was staying with these pictures and she had pictures and talked to her. And it's the strangest experience because you look alike. Right. And not only do we look alike, but we talked alike. The way we express ourselves, the way we gesticulate, all that stuff. So uh, shockingly similar considering I never met her before. Right, right, right. 
Well, it's like all those twin studies, right? Where twins that are separated at birth and then they connect and they're both in the same profession and they talk and sound that, you know, it's that nature versus nurture. Well, it's, there was one, really there was one particular thing at that meeting that made me know. <laughs> we were sitting there talking in the bar and it was maybe, I don't know, 10 o'clock or 1030 at night. And she said, listen, I, she said, listen, I'm kind of hungry. Is there a place we can go to just get like a hamburger or something that's still open? So this is a long time ago. This is the 80s. So there were Jackson Hole restaurants all over New York at the time. I don't know. If <laughs> so I said, well, yeah, there's a Jackson Hole down the street. We can go get a hamburger. So we go to Jackson Hole and we're sitting there, you know, kind of looking at each other and talking and eating. And she had on this beautiful white um, blouse, silk, like fancy blouse. And <laughs> she took a bite of the hamburger and about yeah. a cup of ketchup oh, came yeah, squirting yeah. out of the back of it. And I knew if I had any doubt prior to that, that this was actually my you biological mother. I that's knew funny. at that moment that we were, you know, deeply. Oh, related. that's so funny. Um, um, how did that inform, like, that relation? Obviously, you stayed in touch. You developed a relationship after that. You stayed in mm -hmm. touch. And um, did that inform your work? Did your work change? Did you feel like as a human, as an adult, as an artist, something shifted after that? Well, it's complicated. I mean, I found uh, the relationship with her also became... I'm still friends with her and she lives yeah. out here and she's still alive. Unlike my other parents that raised me who are both gone now. Um, but it became complicated because it became clear to me, as I said, that she wanted me, I represented a lot of things to her that were lost. And I think she wanted, and to some degree expected me to act with the filial sense of obligation and also um, affection that uh, would have been appropriate had she raised me, but in fact she hadn't. Right, right. And, and uh, she was mercurial in her emotions also and very, and very easy to turn. She could very easily get angry. And, I, and, I, and also she, uh, she told me who my father was and I pursued a relationship with this guy that was my father who was a, an artist. And then about four years into this, um, she said to me, listen, uh, you know the guy that I said was your father? I said, yes. Uh-oh, uh-oh, where's this going? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I said, well, he's not. It's somebody else. <laughs> so I got very angry at this and very upset. And I said, well, why did you tell me it was this guy and allow him, this guy, to believe it and me to believe it? And yeah. It, yeah. I said, well, it was this other guy and this other person that it was was actually somebody who I didn't really know as well. And the guy that I said it was, was somebody that I really loved and I kind of wished it was. So it's just again. the year of magical thinking a little bit. Yeah, well, again, it's this narcissistic, not yeah. to make much of this point, but there are some people who have this idea that if it makes them feel good, it must be good for the world. Right, That's in well, it's also interesting. First of all, this is a fascinating story and uh, this whole private adoption, artistic community, let's pass the babies around scenario is kind of surreal, but it's also surreal the um, the similarities and some qualities between your biological mom and your adoptive mom, right? It's not like you got, well, the adoptive mom was the, you know, the, the biological was this crazy artist, and then the adoptive mom was this, no, this is not, you got kind of, you got that from both sides in a way. Yes, I did, and <laughs> and, and it You're didn't like, stop, hey. it didn't stop there. Oh boy. <laughs> It didn't stop there. <laughs> now, I, I, I mean, I think as far as those, those two are concerned, I can't claim any culpability. I think that just kind of happened. Yes. But I think there were certain exactly. paradigms set up in me. Right. Not, you know, kind of some fucked up things that uh, probably I uh, uh, continued, uh, you know, some, some, some uh, maladaptions, let's say. To think. Yes. I think um, we all do, right? I mean, we all are, the, we all the, the, the product of our parents. I'm always amazed where I'm like in therapy 20 years later and I'm still talking about parent stuff. And I'm like, this shit never goes away. Like, it's just, you're still talking my about parents, it. I'm like, my I'm still parents are long in the ground, long in the ground and I'm still trying to, but that's the way we are. You know, yeah. that's the way we are. And, right. and the, truth, the truth of the matter is, um, you don't get over exactly your neurotic predispositions and, and the psychodynamic forces that make life difficult, but you find ways of hope, you know, you yeah. can find ways of coping with them. Well, and they were just masking them really well to the right people. Um, well, the thing is most people either want to replay the scene 
with this, a similar yes. parent and get a better outcome, yes. or they want the opposite. You know, if your mother was a was a was a, I went through a I went through a long period where I was only interested in Asian girls. Okay. You know, okay. Very. Th no, this is this is humorous to me now, <laughs> but you know, my my mother was so demanding and so full of correction and so always telling me how to do everything. Right that I needed someone who was rather obsequious and, you know. And just, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I feel like I, I, it's always interesting. I, for a while, I would, um, I, I'm glad we got into the psychotherapy because I haven't had therapy in weeks because I got tired of the Skype therapy. So I'm glad I can let this out now with you, Fred. But um, for a while, I would find myself, yes, like you said, seeking out partners that resembled, you know, all the negative qualities that I dealt with with my parents in a kind of repetition compulsion going, I'm gonna master this. I'm going to You're going to win. You're going to get you're going to get the outcome that you felt you should have had. You should have had as opposed to saying, let me not hang out with someone that brings this out in me. Let me hang out with someone that does not trigger this in me. And that was the big learning curve because as opposed to like this like I'm going to learn how to do that. Let me hang out with an you know what I mean? And it's it's such a a moment and I envy because you see a lot of people that do that repetition component, you know that marry their mother or father. Endlessly. Let me, let me tell though. you a great, sad psychological truth. Okay, okay I'm gonna eat a cracker. I'm sorry, the wine, I'm trying to absorb the wine. Fine, go ahead. Eating a cracker, I'm gonna be quiet about it. No, no, go ahead. When, here's a strange truth, but it's absolutely real. When someone is the victim of, of, of a kind of oppression in a relationship, particularly a formative relationship, like with a parent, like you have one parent who is abusive or completely overpowering or bossy or somehow overpowers the weaker party. Right. You might think that the dream of that overpowered party would be to be free of the whole paradigm, to say, I don't want this whole kind of imbalancing. In fact, what people dream of and what they seek is to find the opposing situation. Where they're That's overpowering, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's why 100%. people who that's why people who are sexually abused wind up sexually abusing. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, I, I get it. It's it, it, it's a sad truth that people don't want to leave the fucked up model. They want to win at the fucked up model. Yeah. No, it is. And however you win it, whatever that illusion of control you have, whether it is trying to master it by repeating the same scenarios or just doing acting out in the same way. I remember I, um, and this will be my last trauma of the day, and I want to talk about some of your acting work before we um. Oh, but, that. Uh, <laughs> I remember I, I met a guy that I really kind of fell for, and he had been cheated on by his girlfriend with his best friend. So he was, he was scarred. He was scarred. And I was not the rebound. Maybe I, I don't, I'd like to think I wasn't the rebound. I was the rebound. But he ended up cheating on me. Now, he had never cheated on anybody's life, but this was his control. I'm like, but this is something you hated that happened to you. Why'd you do it to me? But again, it's not a conscious, it's a stronger force. And I guess, you know what I mean? And, and that, yeah. it wasn't like a pathological cheater. He just needed to know what that felt like in this revenge scenario. And I was, I was the victim. It was a sad time. It was a sad time. Um, so can I ask, <laughs> for, so, so, I'm, so I'm curious, if, if, I'm, if I'm not asking too personal a question. Please. Since we're talking personal. We're, we're going personal. We didn't talk about the Coen brothers today. Let's go personal. <laughs> we talked about abortion, scarring, adoption, everything. My being cheated on. So, what, so what kind of guys in general excite you? Wow, Fred. That's the million dollar question. Um, I mean, I've run the gamut. I... I don't, I don't respond well to passive people because I'm... I'm so active and proactive in my life. What I'm looking for, the perfect man for me, would be strong enough in their masculinity, and I use that in traditional, to not, to be okay with a strong woman. I feel like I've found certain men that are attracted to a strong, independent woman, but they're looking kind of to be mothered. And I am never able, and then I end up feeling like I'm wearing the pants. again, I'm using this because I don't like those traditional, but wearing the pants, and it's like, well, I'd also like time to be tender and soft and let someone else manage, you know, manage things. And it's a hard combination to find because you either find men that feel emasculated and lash out, or you feel like they're so, you know, soft and like passive that I'm like, I lose respect for them. So how do you find that perfect combination 
of someone who's, you know, just confident and doesn't feel a need to, you know, swing their cock around to be vulgar for just a second. So that's kind of what I'm looking for, because I found that when I deal with that, I end up becoming too strong. But I also, I don't want someone who's a rageaholic, who's u- uber alpha male that I, because I end up kind of cowering. So how do you find that? And it's a unicorn. I have yet to find them. Yet, yet. It's, it's, it's yet to happen. So I'm looking. So, I'm looking out. So, okay. <laughs> so is that an idea or is that actually what you're attracted to? Because what I'm curious is not what, that's an idea. It's an idea. You know what? You're right. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I, I go case by case. I don't make any preconception. You know, um, as you get older and you have a kid, you know, I joke about this, that I keep meeting sad dads that end up, I become their therapist and they're talking about the crazy, there was always a crazy ex which drives, why is there always a crazy ex? Like, you know, there's no self-awareness of the scenario they're in and, and they're not healed yet. Um, so it gets harder as you get older and you have a child and you're dealing so with- So are they usually people that also have kids? I've tried, I've run, like I said, I've run the gamut. I've gone um, from men in their 40s and 50s that have, don't have kids and that's a whole other level of narcissism. <laughs> and then I go, I'm kidding, but you know. And then I'm dealing with people that have kids that are just weeping to me at the table for two hours because their family unit is broken. I'm talking about people that have been with someone for 20 years or 20 no, I hear you. years. I understand. It's not an easy situation to be in. And they moved out of the big house. They live in some shithole in Yonkers. They're, you know, they're not used to not seeing their kids. And here I am going, I'm in a good mood. You know what I mean? And they're weeping at the table. So it's been, it's been cha- it's challenging. I mean, it's challenging. And as someone who's, again, very proactive and, strong and direct that's also a cultural thing that's hard for people you know um and i can't deal with the, the passive or the skirting i like i can handle anything as long as i'm being direct someone's being direct and honest with me i think that's my big thing so fred if you know anybody please funnel them my way my god maybe we can talk to crystal field maybe she has like a new business she's left the obstetrics and, and abortion clinic and has now moved on to Setting up damaged people with other damaged people. Um, before we wrap up, I know we don't have a lot of time. Are you working on anything now? Uh, you know, I love your yes. work so much. So I think you're oh, so you're, brilliant. You're such I'm a brilliant actor. That. You make me laugh all the time and I love it so much. So what's going I on? I have a bunch of things in the pipeline that thankfully most of which got done or my part got done before the shit hit the COVID shit hit the fan. The COVID fan? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a, a show that will be uh, premiering in December. Uh, on Disney Plus, which is a, a Marvel show called okay. WandaVision. Oh. It's a big uh, tentpole, you know, uh, Marvel super duper presentation with all the big Marvel stars in it. And the way it works now at Marvel, I've found out, is that the television shows and the movies all have the same actors and the same characters in them. And they move, you move back and forth if you're lucky. Okay. So I have this new show um, called WandaVision. Uh, which will be, I can't tell you too much about it, except that it's really, really kind of mind blowing and interesting. I feel like I saw uh, a trailer. It was like- Yeah, the trailer, they, they, they yeah. just showed the trailer on the Emmys and they showed it again on some big Super Bowl right. type thing. Um, so I'm in that, That's that will be happening on Disney Plus in December. I also have um, a couple of features that are coming out. Um, hang on one sec. No problem. I'm so old. You gotta look just, them up. You gotta I see what you've done. That's exactly right. Oh, Fred, isn't that, isn't dementia's that, tough. Dementia's tough. I know. We'll get through it together. <laughs> okay. So here's what I have that's, that's, in the, that's, that's coming. Yeah. I have a film. The first uh, film from Paramount Animation, the new re, the reformulated Paramount Animation called Rumble. Okay. That will be opening uh, the beginning of 2021. I also have a film called Marzipan. Kind of interesting take on spy films. Very psychedelic, interesting take. Another comedy uh, that I really enjoyed doing called Together-ish. Uh, with Ed Helms and Patty Harrison, Tig Notaro, and oh, I play wow. Nora, Nora Dunn's husband in that. And I play uh, Ed Helms's dad in that. Uh, then I have um, uh, WandaVision, which I told you about. Yeah. Uh, and then I have a film that's just opening now um, called uh, Shiva Baby, which is, we talked about Judaism. It's kind of interesting. I feel like film. I saw a poster for that for some reason. Yeah, it's ju- it, it just won some big prizes at um, South by Southwest. Okay. and the Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, it stars a young woman called Rachel Sennett, and I play her father, and Polly Draper is her mother. Oh. And she's a kind of a casual sex worker college student in the movie, 
And uh, she gets called to go to a shiva of somebody that she doesn't really know, uh, along with her parents, me and Polly Draper. And a guy shows up who she's been having this kind of sugar baby relationship with at the shiva with his family that she didn't know about. That's what the, the idea of this I movie. like it. I know I hate these questions, what do you prefer? Do you have a preference for comedy over drama or you like equal, both, equally, both equally? I can't even speak anymore. Um, I, like, I like them both. I'm very often, I'm more often called upon to do comedy because you know how it works when, they, when, they, when you, people see you one way, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. they kind of associate you with that. But it's funny because early on in my career, I was mostly playing villains. Um, lots and lots of mean villains. Um, are you at then, a point in your career where these are straight offers or do you still have to audition sometimes? Uh, fortunately for me, I rarely audition. That's rarely nice. Rarely audition. I, I'm not a, I'm a, I feel like I'm a great actor. I'm not a good auditioner. That's, that's been my downfall sometimes. Nobody likes it. <laughs> Nobody likes yeah, it. Yeah, some people are good at it though. Do you know what I mean? But I can really sabotage myself sometimes, even though- Well, I, I want to tell you two other things that I forgot to tell you that yeah, are- please, that, please, that please. I want to, um, I have two um, uh, animated shows ah. um, that are on the air. One is called F is for Family, and I'm in the new season of that. That will be coming around in a few months. That's uh, Bill Burr's show. Oh, I love Bill uh, Burr. Uh, on um, Netflix. Uh, and then um, I have another one uh, that will be uh, premiering soon called Summer Camp Island. I'm on this season of Summer Camp Island also, which is Summer a- Summer Camp, I, I feel like I did. I, I think I auditioned or did I do voiceovers for Summer Camp Island? I feel like- You I might did. well have, it's been on for a couple of years already. No, I feel like I did something for Summer Camp Island. I did, I did. Yeah. Okay, amazing. Um, wow, I feel like I learned something about myself today. I don't know what it is yet, Fred, but I feel like all our talks, <laughs> I feel like I need to get a journal and hone in about the man I really want. I feel like this, comp when you asked me that question, I was like, uh-oh, should I do a vision board? I don't know what, what's going on anymore. Um, so thank you for that. And I think that you should write a screenplay about your adoption because that's, that's a show in itself, Fred. I mean, come on. New York, 70s, 80s, theater for the new city. You know, people, other people have said that because it's a, it's, a, it's a story that I've told a lot of people. I have another thing that I'm working on in the show, but I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that another time. Unless okay. I, mean, I don't want to um, take I love you, Fred. So people can keep a bread. You don't do a website or just people just should look out for the stuff that you mentioned? No, I'm on, I'm on Facebook, which is no website. Um, I don't do any of that uh, web stuff. The web, the social media stuff, okay. Not, not very uh, expertly anyway, no, I don't. Um, but, well, uh, I love I'm, you, Fred. I'm, I feel like I want to give you a hug. It's been so long since I saw you in person. It's kind of outrageous. It's been a couple I would, of I would gladly put a plastic bag over my head and hug you passionately. Oh, thank you. I feel like I need a 46 minute hug at this point. <laughs> I started, sh I've gotten so slutty, I've started shaking hands. I mean, I, I just went to see my friend play jazz on the corner here in Tribeca, and I shook the sax player's hand. I shook, the, like, I'm getting slutty. So I don't know what's happening. It's a sad state of affairs, but I, I, I did wash my hands when I came home. I did, I did, I washed them. I, um, I wear rubber gloves all the time, so I can fist people on the bus, it doesn't matter. That's a delightful image to leave us with. Fred Melamed <laughs> fisting you. random people on public transportation. Yes. Um, new typecast. Uh, thank you, Fred, so much for joining. Great I love you so you. much, and congrats on all the amazing work and all your. And thank you for being so honest and and, and open uh, with us with your story. Even oh. though I feel like you told it to a lot of people, I felt like I was special. And then you're like, no, I've told this story to a lot of people. Well, you are special. Thank you. You are special. I appreciate talking to you. It's a pleasure. <laughs> I love you, Fred. Thank you so much. I'll talk thank to you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye. How's everybody doing? I am. Um, I need to pee, but I'm holding it in. I don't know if you can see that in my face. Uh, I'm going to bring Jason Kaplan. Jason Kaplan and I met many years ago. I'll bring him on. Let me just bring him on so he can come and tell you his, our story, which isn't as juicy as one would think. Um, hi! <laughs> Jason, we, we, when did we date? Was it like 20 years ago? And it was brief. We dated? Didn't we date? Oh, God, I can't believe you don't remember and I do. That's even more embarrassing. It was before I moved to L.A. Before or, you moved to L.A.? Yeah. I thought I was visiting or something like that. And, oh, my uh, God. I don't think we even hooked up. We just, like, went out on a couple of dates and became friends. Yeah. It was one of those instant friend situations. Yeah. And I was crying at home. Um, you're in front of a, what I assume is a bagel oven. That's. I was trying to figure out where in my, like, five square feet that I have here, I should pose myself. Yeah, this is my, my oven, uh, the big, uh, it's not even that, it's, I, have, I have another oven in storage. This is a, 
but like a traditional New York style. A, there's a carousel in there. Ah, kind of. okay. I know Still I wanted to dispel cool. some notions. Um, obviously, you, you're a New Yorker as well, yeah? Or no? You, you know, uh, no, I grew up um, outside of D.C., but I, I lived in New York um, from the mid-90s until a few, uh, 2003 or four around. Okay, the because yeah. obviously, I do believe, as a whole, it's much easier to get a great bagel in New York than it is in L.A., which is, I guess, why you cornered that market, because you're like, what the fuck? Is it the water? Is that just one of those stupid mythologies? <laughs> it's the water. It's the water. I'm like, so bring in the fucking water. Like, what is the yeah. water? I don't think so. Everyone, a lot of people ask that. They, uh, I don't think so. I think that's it's a convenient thing to say. You, okay. you put any self-respecting bagel maker or pizza maker or whatever and brought them out here, and I'm pretty sure they could make something indistinguishable from what they were making. There's not actually that much water in a bagel. It's a there very low it's a minute. It's a minute amount. Yeah, but there's something, uh, there's something special about um, standing on, on a corner in New York and eating a slice of pizza or, you know, having a cup of coffee um, or eating gelato in, um, in Florence. You know, those are very specific experiences and the food is part of it. So, yeah, of course, having a bagel not in New York is going to feel different. No, but I do think on a, on a very bare bones quote, like I go to the deli or the bodega and I have a bagel anymore. It's a great bagel. I mean, well, they don't know. you can't find that. Yeah, that's largely because they don't know what they're going for. They don't have yeah. an opinion on it. You know, if, the, if you grew up in L.A., then you're, you're, what your benchmark is is very different than what you grew up if you grew up in, in New York. You know, so I they, they, they don't have a to get into opinion. the because you weren't a baker, right? Like, when did you start baking and become the bagel guy? Like, when did that idea sprout uh, and how did you come about? I, you know, a friend of mine um, in about, at this point, like 12 or uh, 15 years ago, thought it would be a good idea to put a bagel shop in Silver Lake. And, and so we started investigating it and she lost interest. And I sort of filed it away as a thing that I could do or might be a thing to do because I was looking for something new after the film business. And then when the opportunity to work at um, Jelena, which is a local, you know, I like Jelena in Venice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Venice. When that when that came about, I said, all right, well, let me see if I have the chops for the restaurant business. And um, you know, I was like, I'll do this for a year. And then a year turned into four or five. And at a certain point um, during my tenure there, I made it known that I was interested in pursuing a bagel you know, project. And, and I had to put it in my contract that if I was going to keep working there, that they had to let me work on my bagel recipe. And how did you, where did you do the research on that? Did you like start, you know, paying people uh, secret money to get their secret bagel recipe? Or I, have an aunt, I have an aunt who paid, who went to New York in the fifties and spent thousands of dollars. I don't, you can't, I can't tell you how much, but for a cheesecake recipe and a Caesar salad recipe, for her, um, for her restaurant called uh, the Babalu Room down okay. in Miami. I no, for me, it was a lot of like reading books. It came from like, I started making bread. That was how I ended up working at Jelena in okay. a way. But, but I, it was just um, books, watching videos, and then sort of like, you know, if you have an idea of what you're going for with whatever food product it is, um, you know, there are only a certain number of starting points and then after that it's just trial and error and working towards what your goal is so you know if you have a if you're looking for a fudgy brownie right you know you're gonna there's you know you're gonna it's start so much you can do so yeah. you, okay so do we attribute the fact the dearth the dearth the scarcity of good bagels is because there's just not as much of an interest it's a little yeah. bit of the water and it's just people not take because i know brooklyn bagel I haven't, I mean, I, you know, are they your competition? Are they much bigger? Like, or do you have like a niche audience? What's your- uh... I don't see anyone as my competition because bagels are a very like neighborhood specific thing. If you were in New York and someone on 76th Street says, oh, a guy over on 61st Street just opened a bagel shop, you'd be like- Yeah, fuck you, right. Uh, so yeah, what? Yeah. Right, so, right. So, you know, it's only that because now it's like you have to photograph everything and everyone has to write about you know, what's new and what's hot, then it's like, oh, here's the 12 top bagel places in LA. And you're like, well, good. I'm going to go to the one that's close to my house. Most and of our you been, customers- Did you need, like, did you end up getting funding? Did you fund it yourself? Did you have to look for investors? Like- um, I had two, I had two friends, close friends that chipped in a little bit, which ended up being a very small percentage. And mostly it was me doing a pop-up um, 
um, first like at a coffee shop and I did Schmorgisberg and I, um, for a long, the longest time I was doing Hollywood farmer's market. Right. And, and because I didn't have a shop and I didn't have any, you know, a staff to support and stuff, I just ended up funding most of the project myself with just, you know, my wife's a teacher and I was like just kind of funneling all the money into new equipment and eventually like, we, uh, you know, that's kind of what happens. So has it become lucrative or are you still trying to break even for the investment? No, no, it's lucrative. I mean, it's, Amazing. I don't know about lucrative, but it's, you know, I support myself and, and, um, it's fine. Our, we have a lot of regulars. I love it seeing a catch up with everyone for 10 seconds, you know, several times a week. And uh, we have some people that schlep across town or wherever to come get their bagels on the weekends or whatever. Now it's like very easy without. Are you doing the whole bagel cream cheese locks thing like super Jewy, the white fish salad? You're doing all the salad huh. too? I am because, uh, you know, there's some people in town that are like having their, their modern day twists on all kinds of stuff. For me, I feel like one of the reasons, getting back to what you were saying before, a, a lot of people in LA just haven't experienced like the appetizing culture that, that I'm familiar with and right. like the deli culture where you go into the, super, the supermarket in the back and, 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 um, and you pointed the stuff in the cases. So I, I, wanted to people, I wanted people to um, have the experience that I had growing up, which is a very specific type of sandwich, very specific offering. So yeah, we've got sable, we've got kippered salmon and whitefish salad and stuff like that. Making and, you know, I'm not mixing like hemp seeds into my bagels or anything like that, but someone else is going to do that. It's fine. If you want like... I like your traditional. I feel like sometimes people try too hard. I mean, sure, would I... Do I need strawberry cream cheese? I don't. Do I need a weird ass bagel? No, I'm happy with everything. You know what I mean? So I yeah. guess it's fun to experiment sometimes, but there's something very comforting about the rusted yeah. daughters or whatever. You know, you're going in, you're getting your, your smoked fish, but it is a Jewy thing. I feel like... Jew food culture is much more rampant on the East Coast than sure. it is on the West Coast. I mean, but West Coast has the burrito and the taco thing nailed down, and that's kind of yeah. like the local thing. But maybe if you go to the West Side, but East Side, you're right. Like, there was nothing nothing there. Yeah, that's what it is. So for me, I just am trying to introduce people or at least give people a chance to have something. And in a, lot, in a bunch of cases, it's people who, like, remember what they grew up with and they yes. haven't been able to find it, and so they're happy about that. But I have a lot of people you know, who are raising their kids here and they say, oh, I really wanted my kid to have what I had. And honestly, it's mostly selfish. I just want to eat this all the time. So, you know, this is what we have at the shop is what I want to eat. That's good. That's very narcissistic and delightful of you. And I'm happy you're doing it. So um, I want to send everybody to more. Now, is Maury a family member? It just sounded super Jew. And you were like, let me just name it. my middle name. So, you know, it's more bagely sounded than Jason. So I was like, you I gave a guy it. named Maury. Actually, was, this is no, killing me. I know. Holy shit. I never. Anyone. None of my friends. If I. No one ever knew what my middle name was, or I would just like swear them to secrecy. And then suddenly I'm like, you know, Maury, Maury, Maury. I love that you have the name of like a 70 year old Jewish man from the shtetl. <laughs> it's like, you know what I mean? Because it's like if it's Jason's bagels, I feel like they're gluten free and they're vegan, and there's like a spin cycle <laughs> next door. But Maury's bagels, you could tell people I'm a fifth generation bagel maker from the Ukraine and they would believe you. Like there's no need to create another backstory. Yeah. So, very smart. Yeah. Bagels are my middle name. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> go to Maury's Los Angeles, uh, Silver Lake. Is there a website? Or I want to send people to you. Yeah, you can go to maurysbagels.com. Just come on okay. over. Yeah. I'm going to come over. When I get back to New York, I'm going to be needing some decent bagels. Yeah. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Jason. I love you. Love you too. Thanks for having me. Good luck me. with everything. Um, and I'm going to just, I'm going to stop your video. I'm just doing it. I hate to be so like aggressive and goodbye. Um, our final guest of the evening is a amazing woman that I met a few years ago. We were working together. I think we're developing her one woman show. She's got a fascinating history as well. And she's a, a brilliant comic and performs all across New York City and now all across Zoom. Sonia Vai, come on up. You're the next contestant. On the price is right. Um, da -da 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 -da. Yay! Hi. <laughs> How are you? All right, I'm gonna ask you a favor, Sonia. Yeah, go ahead. You wanna go pee? I gotta pee. You entertain. Go pee. I'm, I'm gonna mute because I have such a stream that I feel like the stream is gonna overpower <laughs> you. It's like a fucking racehorse. So I'm gonna urinate. Go do it. You want? You're, you're well versed in. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know who's watching. Up. Sorry? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to go, go ahead. Go pee. Go pee. Go pee. I'll, 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 don't worry. I'll fill it in. Hey guys. 
I don't know who's watching because I can't see who's on, but uh, like my new background, look, see, now I can tell everyone I'm still in New York. I am, even though I never go outside anymore. Uh, and even though things are opening up, I feel like it's just too, the weather's gone bad and, you know, uh, um, Iris was talking about going back to LA with Maury and I were Jason Kaplan from Maury's Bagels and I can't wait to go back to LA. Although I heard you can't breathe out there right now. So maybe there's no good place to go, uh, which is why I'm sitting in front of my computer uh, trying to fill dead air. <laughs> I don't know. I can always amuse myself. I feel like I'm talking to a void. Like this isn't really happening. This is all happening in my head. And I'm just pretending that there's audience out there and uh, it's working because look, I'm, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. And she's back. Yay. Oh, there's something so gratifying about a really good urination. Yes. You know what I mean? Is. Oh, that was fantastic. Yay. Um, I miss you. I haven't I seen miss you. I miss you too. You look beautiful as always with the freedom so power you. in the background. You like that? You like this? That's amazing. Um, how do we that. master? I, I, you have a green screen or just a virtual background? The Zoom? It's just a virtual background uh, on Zoom. I do have a green screen. And when you put that up and then you put the virtual background, it's better. It's no? better. Yeah. Yeah. Because like right now, see, I, like you're, you're like, I'll, you disappear if there's no. Yeah, there's weird. I remember I went on a TV show. They didn't tell me it was green skin and I wore green and I was pretty much a floating head, which is kind of <laughs> cool. I was like, really? <laughs> um, what's going on? You've been, so I met you like, what was it? Four years ago, I guess, right? We were working on your one woman show and your background, your relationship to India and your Indian heritage. I think it was it four years ago because I got I I uh, I moved back to New York four years ago. Yeah, I think you maybe just, it was yeah. right when I moved yes. back. You're right. Yes, we both moved here. Yes, that's and great. then after um, a few years, I was like, I'm going back to LA, which was not an easy decision. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt and tell me how you feel now. But it's like obviously I miss doing stand up. I I don't do stand up in LA just because it's like starting to hustle there. It's like here it's so much easier and people. Yeah. But I got tired of. Um, living like like a like a student i mean i was li you saw me with my kid it was like yeah a new dorm i mean it was insane yeah so i, mean, I don't blame you especially especially because your son how is he doing by the way he's delightful he's he's gotten into edm he's eight years old and he's Aww. making these, these music tracks he's like this is a great drop i love that's tracks. amazing <laughs> happening I'm going to put him up at the W Hotel and just be like an eight-year-old DJ. That's so adorable. And so that's going to be in. That's how everyone's going to come to the party because it's going to be an eight-year-old DJ. Exactly. I think um, I will be. Um, how are you doing? How's your material evolved? You still, like, tell me about your, your stand-up trajectory over the last couple of years. I mean, I'm, you know, until the quarantine hit, uh, this year was looking out to be really good. I started doing feature gigs on the road and I uh, was just performing every night. Um and things, I, you know, things were really great. I had, I had a lot more material. I was feeling really good about it. It was just, it was great getting paid for the first time to do That's comedy, nice. you know, actual nice. paychecks. Yeah, yeah. More than just yeah. like the $20. Sure. Uh, and then of course COVID hit. And so I was like, this is just my luck. You know, <laughs> I bust my ass in New York for three years and boom. Well, what's your, um, like, what's the goal? Like, is the goal late night or is the goal like a special or is there no goal and you're just enjoying doing it and that's it? No, my goal is to like sell at MSG. You know, I want to make 10 million people laugh. Like that's it. I want to do comedy all over the world. I don't want to necessarily do road comedy, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that just means, you know, getting, uh, having a presence somewhere, either it being online or on television. Uh, actually during COVID, since I had so much time off, I, I wrote a pilot and oh, that's, oh, and it's loosely based on that solo show that we were working on. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you have it's, such it's, a fascinating story and this whole notion of Indian identity. I mean, how have your parents been dealing with you, the comedy pursuit? I mean, are your parents is involved with your, in your adult life as they were when you were a kid and like, you know, how they don't know I do comedy. They still don't know you do comedy? They still don't know. No, they still don't know. Yeah. I know people, people, it's so funny when I see a reaction, people get so people, I've had different people have different reactions and some people, it's just like, it's so shocking to them that this is something I wouldn't tell my parents. Um, and yet for me, it wasn't even something I thought twice about. Right. So do you feel, I mean, do you feel a sense of, of shame or just that you don't want to deal with the headache of them giving you shit for doing comedy? I, it's the latter for sure. Like I don't, definitely don't feel any shame doing comedy, but I know that my father would shame me. Yeah. 
And yeah. I think it's just to protect myself from that shame. You know what I'm saying? No, I get No, wait, do you have siblings? I do. I have a, a, a much older sister and uh, we're, you know, we're more than a decade apart. So we, we weren't that close either when I moved to, like once I moved to LA and told her I was pursuing my dreams, it, that was also like, I was persona non grata. So, um, but I told her about two years ago. And, and was she supportive and excited about seeing your material and stuff? I mean, she came to a show about a year later. Okay. <laughs> but it's so a progress. year, but that's okay. Yeah. But like never. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's, uh, we also are trying to, I guess, working on repairing our relationship. Okay. Okay. And so it's, you know, just, there's so many complex things <laughs> in my family. So many As complicated things. Today from everybody, right? Everybody's got their story. It's kind of insane. Yeah. Um, but does it pain you at all to not be able to share? Like, do you, do you deep down, have you let go of the part that doesn't want your parents' approval? And like support, have you let, really let that go? Or is it still a little bit like, oh, I wish I could show them this and I want to hear great job, Sonia. And like, you know. Yeah, no, I don't think I'll ever let go of wanting that. I don't think any child really does. I don't think you yeah, I don't, I don't think you can. You can. Um, I think that will always be like a, a painful thing for me, as is my childhood. Like yeah. I'm never going to be able to, it's a, I think Chris Rock actually said it. He goes, the pain never goes away. Right. You, know, you, yeah. just, you just learn how to deal with it. And then you can also do amazing things with it. Yeah. So I think that's, that's what it is. And that kind of fuels my purpose as well to be like, okay, I went through this journey right. and now I'm here. And it's, it's funny because before COVID, of course, my goal was money related, right? It was like, I want to make $10 million. Like that was always the, you know, how like uh, Jim Carrey wrote that check out. Very worthy artistic endeavor. Like I know, right? To make $10 million. I know. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like that, that, that check that, um, yeah. I think Jim Carrey wrote for himself, right? Oh, right. I remember that. Yes. Yeah. So that's sort of why I did it. And then during COVID, I think a lot changed for me. And I was like, I'm not even going to think about the money anymore. Now I just want to make 10 million people laugh. Yeah. Because I really think if I can make 10 million people laugh, that will be something for me that, you know, I will have touched those lives. And that, like, that's what I want. That is my purpose on earth is to make people laugh, to, you know, let them know things are going to be okay, especially for people who've had difficult childhood childhoods yeah. where it's like, yeah. you know, you can still live your life. It's a lot tougher and you have exactly. to go to therapy. <laughs> But. And comic. I have never, I, I have yet to meet, maybe I've met one or two well-adjusted comics, but they are few and far between. And artists in general. I mean, there's a reason, right? I mean, yeah, I got to find some purpose to deal with all the shit. Right. So like, let me just justify, you know what I mean? Having all this shit and put it into the art. Um, are you still dating comics or you've branched out? I actually have been in a relationship for almost two years now. Oh my God. Yeah. He is, he is a comedian as well. Uh, when you spend 24 hours a day doing comedy, it's really hard to meet people outside of Can comedy. Can I ask but, who it is? Yeah, his name is Eric Branstein. He's Eric wonderful. Okay. Um, but uh, it, it's funny because he is one of those that you mentioned who's few and far between. He is, he he's is a that nice, guy. solid. Okay, he's a, like he's a great guy. I like yeah. that. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Eric Brand, so, he's a Jew. So he's I'm a Jew. Jew with that. That, makes <laughs> that he is. <laughs> he um. I'm not going to ask. So when are the kids coming? I'm not going to do that. I um, don't want to have children. So perfect. So then there's yeah, no, the so question. There's um, no pressure. Yeah. Eric will have to deal with his mother in that department and you don't have, it's not your problem. I don't have to deal with it. There you go. You know, perfect. We're, yeah. Um, what's your performance schedule like now? Are you doing the park shows? What's happening? I did. I did a park, park show, show this past weekend. Actually tomorrow I'm doing a great Zoom show. It's a fundraiser for Bergen Community College. Okay. And that's going to be really exciting because they're going to do like a virtual studio audience and um and then they're going to send it to they're going to send it out almost as a like a television show okay we'll see how it goes it's a it's a zoom experiment right but um find you are you affiliated with bergen community college in any way shape or form no not at all i did a i i did very few uh in-person uh shows during COVID. obviously like until june the end of june july everything was on lockdown right okay. but even after things opened up i was just really too nervous to, to do anything. And, and I just had a lot of anxiety over performing in public. And, yeah. you know, we still, we still just didn't know enough about the virus. I think, yeah. And I still think we don't, but, um, I have, I have now started to, uh, do in per like very, I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting in is what it, that, that's like, <laughs> wait in, take your Yeah, time. that's what I'm doing. I did a park show. I had a blast, but at this point I could be performing for like two heroin laden squirrels and I'd be happy you know right I mean? exactly I and think that's what it is you forget people, the feeling 
Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, but it's also interesting how I feel like as an artist, because I'm not, you know, I'm an artist. Yes, you are. Audience, an amazing one. The, uh, thank you. The audience has so much more compassion yes. for artists now than they did before because they know the, sh the, the situation. Where it's, so there's a mutual support there where they need us and we need them in a right. way that's different, that's qualitatively different than the way it used to be. Yes. People used to consume culture and that was it. There wasn't like, oh my God, all these artists, all these comedians where their livelihood has just been taken away and, and right. theater artists and filmmakers are now doing these Zoom shows, which is driving everybody crazy, but it's all we got. Right. You know, I just ran into a very, very, very famous guitarist. I went to see my friend's gig and I go, are you performing online? He goes, yeah, I'm doing it for survival. Now he doesn't need the money, No. but it suddenly- He needs it. Right. You know, he needs it for his emotional state. Yeah, yeah. just for and his so well-being. the compassion from the audience is nice. It's not. Yeah, complete, I really like, like that. You get it. So I like that. That's the the silver linings. The side. And, and you know what? I think it's important. <laughs> I think it is important because that's that's one of the things that the pandemic is teaching us. Yeah. Right. Don't yeah. take life for granted because guess what? It can be over in, in a, a heartbeat. Yeah. You've right. always known that theoretically, but the pandemic's like, nah, bitch, it's here. It's real. <laughs> you know. Real. Yeah, 250,000, uh, 215,000 dead yeah, now. No, it's that's not. The numbers yeah. are depressed. Seven yeah. bazillion cases. Um, can people tune into your show tomorrow night, the Bergen County show? Yes, absolutely. I have a Zoom link. The, the, you have to DM me for the Zoom link. Oh, um, okay. but I know. Only because they're it's not my thing. So they're, they're going to have a, a studio audience. But I perform. Now I've been performing almost every day, either on Zoom or in person. Um, so people so, can find that on, on soniavi.com? It's, I don't necessarily, I don't really have anything. I, I need to update my website. I don't have okay, it on my website. So I have it on Instagram. Instagram. Okay. So at Sonia Vi Comedy. At Sonia Vi Comedy. Okay, folks. So Sonia yeah. Vi Comedy, check out the Bergen County Community College Thank you. fundraiser tomorrow. And check out Sonia, if you're in New York, go see one of her park shows because you're very funny. I know you didn't do stand up today, but I just wanted to talk to you because I just feel like talking. I know. I miss um, you. But people can see your comedy, which is very yes. funny. Yes. And I hope Thank I you. see you before I go. I'm only here for a few more days, but I hope when I do you can leave see you, uh, next week, next Monday. So okay, well let's let's make a plan offline. Let's do it. Let's do okay. it. Call me. Great to Call see you. Me. I will. I love you. Thank you, love sweetheart. You Sonia. Oh, Bye. by the way, I was I was listening to the conversation you had with Fred. Amazing. Story. Amazing. And yeah. all the things you guys were talking about with like that transference. And I was, yeah, like, I, that I was like, that's it. It's it. I, I, I related damaged. to it. We're yeah. all damaged. Um, thank you, love. Okay. Thank uh, you so much. You soon. Have a good night. Okay. Bye. 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 I wanted to thank all of you. I'm, you know why I'm wrapping up? Because I'm hungry and I'm tired of eating these crackers. So I'm going to go out and pay an exorbitant amount of money for a, a bowl of soup because it's Tribeca and everything is insane. I went to a, a Bubby's. You guys know Bubby's? Amazing food. Ridiculous prices. Two people. We were two people. I had eggs. He had eggs. I had OJ. He had OJ. $72. I'm not kidding. $72 fucking dollars for eggs and eggs. OJ, OJ. Not even a mimosa. And I'm sorry if I offend anybody by saying that. I love you all. Erisbar.com, I-R-I-S-B-A-H-R.com. Visit, follow me on Instagram, at Erise.bar. Please Venmo me if you like the show, at Erisbar, no dot. I know there's a lot to handle here. At Erisbar, no dot. People have been sending, and it's been so lovely. It's nice to support. It feels good to be supported. So thank you for that. Um, thank you to all my guests, Fred Melamed, Sonia Vai, Jason Kaplan of Maury's Bagels, I love you all. Have a good evening. Please stay healthy. Please stay safe. Um, wear a damn mask. Vote. Power the polls. Whatever cause you believe in. Um, and I apologize to the vegans that I, I eat meat. I love you all. Have a good night.